Please welcome Dr. Dan Geller. Okay. Uh, what time do you have? Good. Was this response an analytical response or instinctive response? What do you think? Uh, we'll find out soon. That's why we're here today. We're here to find out a couple things. First, the difference between analytical decision-making and intuitive decision-making, especially as it pertains to financial decisions. And then, most, more importantly, how this impacts what we do every day, which is deal with financial products in the banking industry. So today, we are going to go on a short journey from the human mind, the brain, on the left side of the uh, slide, which basically we will discuss the two types of financial decision making and how it impacts our financial behavior. You see, our financial decision making changes the way we behave financially. And we'll talk about that, about the six types of financial behaviors or behaviorology. And then we will discuss how our financial behavior impacts our, the way we interact with financial services, with the banking industry. And we will actually go into some empirical examples that pertain to what we do every day, which is trying to figure out to forecast and to price specifically deposits. So we will actually drill down all the way to how this impacts our pricing and forecasting practices. Let's start in the beginning, which is where pretty much where all decisions originate, and specifically to today's topic, financial decisions. There are two types of financial decisions. On the up the right side of the slide, you see the intuitive type of decision which originates in our reptilian brain. The reptilian part of the brain, which is in the back of our head, is the oldest part of the brain. As you probably know, the brain as we know it today evolved over time. And the reptilian part was the first part uh, to emerge, and the reptilian brain was created for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is survival. This is the guardian of our survival. So when our ancestors faced a tiger in the wood and they ran, this instinct came from the reptilian brain. Our ancestors didn't just take out a calculator and started calculating the odds of survival when they saw the tiger. They just ran. That's the sole purpose of the reptilian brain. Now, the reptilian brain has a few characteristics. First of all, it's very fast by design because, again, it takes care of our survival. And number two, we can do multi-tasks, more than one task, with the reptilian brain. Um, a classic example that we all probably are familiar with, we can drive our cars and talk on the phone at the same time. We can do that because those are instinctive functions that we can do at the same time. So basically the reptilian brain is where our intuitive decisions originate from. In the professional jargon, it's called system one. It's very fast. On the other side of the brain is the neocortex or cortex, which is up here, which is basically the, the thinking part of the brain. This is the latest part of the brain to develop in, in our evolution. And this, this part of the brain 
is analytical, it's much slower, just like computers, when they have to analyze tremendous amount of data, it slows down the, pro the, the process. Um, the one characteristic about the, the cortex, which is the analytical part of the brain, is that it can perform only one task at a time, unlike the reptilian brain that can do multiple tasks. So, um, for instance, um, you wouldn't be able to do your income tax return and drive at the same time. Unless, of course, you owe a lot of money to the IRS, so it doesn't matter. Um, but that's the part of the brain that is involved pretty much in, in computation and analytical decision making. Now, how does this relate to, to the topic today? The catalyst that pretty much shifts our way of thinking between the instinctive and the analytical is the level of money anxiety. Money anxiety is such a strong force in our daily life that it can really change our behavior and more importantly for us here in this room, it can really change the way customers interact with our banks and when I will show you some of the numbers, you'll be amazed at how powerful money anxiety is. So, first, let's see how common it is. This is a study that was done by the American Psychological Association earlier this year that basically every year they survey people and ask them to rate those four categories in the order of stress and anxiety. And lo and behold, money comes up at the top year after year after year. So what this, what this chart is telling us that seven out of 10 people have money anxiety pretty much on a regular basis. They are anxious about money more than they are anxious about their work or their family or even their health. Think about it. People are more worried about money than they are worried about health. One other thing to, to note in this um, chart is that the level of money anxiety fluctuates. And if you'll see the fluctuation pattern vis-a-vis -vis the, the years, you can see that during those years where we had the recession in 2009, 2010, the, the graph goes up and then it declines in, in the later years when the economy pretty much improved, the unemployment went down, things are a little better nowadays. So you can see the fluctuation that corresponds to the economic uh, conditions. Now that we know that money anxiety exist and it's the catalyst of our financial decisions, let's look at how it impacts our financial behavior. And the, our, our financial behavior basically is dictated by the level of money anxiety. There is always money anxiety, but different levels. So on the uh, table on the screen, we are seeing the behaviorology metrics or the financial behavior metrics that has two columns. The column on the left pertain to our savings. This is basically what we deal with every day as far as deposits. And the column on the right hand side pertains to spending. Um, not directly um, relevant to the banking industry, but indirectly because the interaction between savings and spending is basically uh, what drives the economy. So back to the, to the, right, uh, to the left hand side column that talks about savings, there are three rows. Um, the top row represents high money anxiety, the middle one is a moderate money anxiety and the lower one, low money anxiety. So there are three levels of money anxiety, high, moderate, low, and then savings and spending. Now, um, 
I wish we had the time to talk about each one of those because the, uh, each, each financial behavior is fascinating by itself. Um, but you can read all about it in the Money Anxiety book and there are some empirical examples um, about each one of them and how they impact uh, banking decisions. But I, I do want to go into at least one of them in more details to show you how um, behaviorology impacts financial services. A couple more things to note about the behaviorology metrics is that um, this matrix is universal, meaning it does not depend on demographics or psychographics or any type of other type of segmentation. It's universal. We all share those six financial behaviors, regardless of, again, demographics or psychographics. And the other thing to keep in mind about the metrics, the behaviorology metrics, is that it, the behavior changes with economic conditions. And when the economy um, is, is, um, is, is, is declining and money anxiety increases, then we all follow the, the top row of the money anxiety behavior. So let's uh, drill down into uh, the top one, which was mattress money. Mattress money is um, a description of what people really used to do with their money uh, in the old days. Um, so in, in the old days or up to the great, after the great uh, recession, I'm sorry, the Great Depression in the 30s, uh, people, when people felt insecure, they actually took the money and put it under their mattress. And, uh, um, you know, we all saw and read about the, the run on the, on the banks during the Great Depression, and those who were lucky enough to get some money out literally took their money and put it under the mattress because this was the safest place to, to put money uh, in cases like this. There is another reason, and a biological reason, why people used to put money under the mattress before banks had insurance, and that is that biologically, our, our reptilian brain tell us that at times of danger, we need to hold the things that are important to our survival and keep them close to us. And this comes from, again, our ancestors that when they were faced with some type of uh, dangers from the elements or from anything else, the first thing that they did was hold wood and food. Wood to keep warm, food to keep alive. We do the same thing not with wood and food. I, I don't think anybody's going to walk into your branch with a pile of wood and food. But money today is the wood and food of the past because money can buy warmth and food and all the things that are necessary to sustain life. So that's why we, we have this instinct in time of, times of economic uncertainty to hold money. And that's what money, mattress money is all about. Now, let's see how strong money anxiety is in, in times of high money, um, um, when, when the economy is, is not doing very well, how strong money anxiety is. What we are seeing on the slide here basically represents data from the beginning of the recession until now. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see liquid accounts, and the average APY for liquid account, and which is, um, what, 17 basis points. That's the average APY. And in the last uh, seven years since the recession started, the incremental amount of balances, incremental, not total, incremental amount of money that went into liquid accounts is almost $5 trillion, trillion with a T. 
That's how strong money anxiety is. On the right-hand side of the screen, we see term accounts. The average APY for term accounts since the recession is five times as much as the liquid accounts, yet term accounts lost $1 trillion in balances. Think about it for a second because what you are, see, what you are looking at today defies conventional economic and finance thinking that says that money under the same risk level always gravitates towards the highest yield. And what you are looking at today says, well, not always. Not always. And the exception is when money anxiety is high, the rules of conventional economics and finance don't apply. Money anxiety is stronger than that. Here's the proof. Since the recession, six trillion, with a T, six trillion dollars defied yield gravity. It's something to keep in mind because this is something that will reoccur every time we go through an economic cycle. Every time money anxiety will go up, we will see the same behavior. Now that we know that money anxiety not just exists, but it's so powerful and so common, the question is how do we measure it? I mean, we know how to measure interest rates because we can observe it and measure it. We know how to do it for other variables that we can observe and measure. How do we measure money anxiety? It's, it's a latent variable. So luckily, advanced statistics allow us to do that. And it allows us basically to measure the impact that money anxiety has on the dependent variables. It, it's very similar to <clears throat> what scientists are doing in physics. You know that when um, physicians, um, uh, when people who, who deal in, in subatomic particles want to measure, they cannot really observe some subatomic particles, but they can measure the impact that those subatomic particles have on each other when they collide. That's what they do in those big colliders in Lucerne and, and other places. That's exactly the same principle. We cannot observe money anxiety directly. We cannot measure it directly, but we can measure the impact that it has on the, de on the dependent variables. And that's what we are doing here. A couple other things to remember about the money anxiety index. It's objective. What we are measuring is what people actually do with their money, not what they say that they do. And there is a big difference. All the consumer confidence indices out there, like consumer confidence, consumer sentiment, and a whole array of them, are subjective. They are based on a questionnaire. Basically, they go out to people and say, how do you feel about the economy? Well, I guess it depends how, how the person got up in the morning. Uh, and that's why it's subjective. The money anxiety index is the only index that is objective and it's based on what actually people do with their money. And, and the principle in behavioral finance is observe, pay, not say. Observe what they do with the money, not what they say they do with the money. So the money anxiety index is a highly predictive predictor, and it predicted the arrival of the Great Re uh, Recession 14 months before the recession was officially declared in December of 2007. Um, and I have the chart on my homepage, on my, my uh, website, and you can see actually how the money anxiety index, how the graph starts climbing up in October of 2006, when still the real estate market was booming and everybody was talking about how life is wonderful, but underneath, things were not that great and the money anxiety index picked up 
or all the, the economic variables that make up the money anxiety index starting showing up some, some things that are not as, as rosy as everybody thinks. Now let's drill down into why we are all here today and how the, the whole concept of our financial types of financial decision that impact our financial behavior impact our daily life as far as what we do. And again, this example pertains to uh, specific, uh, specifically to deposits. So what we are looking here is regression analysis of the relations between rates and balances of long-term CD with one difference. We added money anxiety as a variable, and that's the key. You see, any model that measures just the relations between rates and balances in order to either price or do a projection is basically inclusive of consumer financial behavior, meaning you are not really seeing the, the, the true relations between rates and balances. It includes other things. And only when you have the money anxiety index as a variable, you are able to separate the two. And here you can see how we separate the two. And you can, you can see clearly what is the impact of rate only on your balances and what is the impact of money anxiety. By the way, where it says long-term CD 8%, it should be money anxiety 8%. The importance here is that this is the only way you can increase the accuracy and effectiveness of your pricing and projection by separating the two. Otherwise, you are paying, price interest expense-wise, you are paying for something that you have no control over. You have no control over financial behavior. You do have control over your rate, but not financial behavior. So if you do any type of analysis for pricing or forecasting that does not distinguish between the two and price or forecast accordingly, two things happen. You either under or overpay, or you under or over forecast. That's guaranteed because we know that. This is another example that's a liquid account money market. And in this case, you can see that when we isolate money anxiety as, as, a, as a separate um, a variable, it contributes 10% to the impact on your balances. So here again, if you're doing any type of pricing analysis or forecasting analysis without isolating the impact of money anxiety, you are mispricing or misforecasting, guaranteed. Now, one more thing to, to remember here and that is that this is a macro analysis, meaning this analysis was done nationally on all financial institutions. If you do it, and you, you should do it, in each one of your pricing regions, you might have even greater variances because smaller samples tend to have greater variances. So don't be surprised if you do this analysis on your local uh, pricing market and you can find out that uh, money anxiety impacts your balances even 20% or more. In summary, money anxiety is a very powerful, relevant, and significant factor in your pricing and forecasting decisions. And you must incorporate it into whatever model you are using to measure relationships between price, rates, and balances. If you don't, again, 
you are either under pricing, over pricing, under forecasting, or over forecasting. And finally, uh, if you have any questions, um, you can always contact me directly. I'll be happy to address any of your questions. And uh, I highly encourage you to uh, read Money Anxiety because it provides very rich examples, empirical examples, of how financial decisions impact what we do here every day in the banking industry. And I thank you very much.